Ayasma Arya Damika is an Austrian Buddhist monk ordained in 2005 in Nyama with Pa'ao Sayadaw as his preceptor and meditation teacher. He maintained a very simple lifestyle, living out in the open and under trees, dedicating himself to mindfulness of breathing and later also to many other meditation subjects. He was initiated into the meditation techniques of Mogo, Mahasi, Shuyumin, Mutejaniya, and Sundun. Bante went to Thailand in 2010, where he stayed for three years at the Wat Pa Nanachat, undergoing the traditional training of a Thai forest monk of the Achan Cha lineage. He stayed in Malaysia from 2013 to 2015, studying Pali, Sutanta, and the Vinaya under the guidance of Venerable Agachita Mahathira. From 2015 to 2018, he stayed in Sri Lanka and returned to Malaysia in 2018 January, where he was appointed the Sangha Nayaka of the SPS Monk Training Center. So we all put our hands together, palms together and welcome Bhante to do his sharing. What do you Bhante? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak uh, to you today, uh, this afternoon and evening. And greetings from SPS Monk Training Center here in Tepping. Actually, we're quite lucky. Just earlier, you know, in the afternoon, there was again a heavy rain here in Taiping. You wouldn't be able to hear anything because on the tin roof inside uh, Makuti, uh, it's very noisy. But the rain has stopped. And it seems the devas are protecting us and they're making it possible for us today to have a bit of a Dhamma conversation. Okay. Well, let me introduce a little bit the topic for the day. Uh, as you probably know, the topic is, is stream entry still possible? And this topic has arisen as part of a larger conversation between our MC, Bobby and myself. And the original question was, what is it that signifies the end of the Buddha Sasana? What is it that marks the end of the, of the Sasana? Is it when there are no more Arahants in the world? Or only when there are no more Aryas? Or maybe when the scriptures have also disappeared? So on that question, it's actually interesting that early teachings are surprisingly silent on the duration of the sasana, or the phases of gradual disappearance of the sasana. But the commentary literature, the Theravada commentaries, uh, has set the duration of the sasana at 5,000 years. And I'm sure many of you will have heard about that before. And the commentaries have come up with many fold ways of dividing the sasana into intervals of 500 or 1,000 years each within those 5,000 years. So within the 5,000, you have then five sequences of 1,000 years each. And the commentaries explain the details of the different stages of the gradual decay of the sasana. Now maybe before we go to the commentaries and the Abhidhamma, let us also first have a look at the Pali sources themselves. And there's one passage uh, from the Chulavaga of the Vinaya Pitaka, the rules for the monks. Um, and there it is stated that the true Dhamma, the Sat Dhamma, will last only for 500 years. In fact, that's the only place where we have a year uh, duration being given. And I would like to highlight here that this passage speaks about the duration of the pure, unadulterated, true Dhamma, about the Sat Dhamma, not about the duration of a corrupted Dhamma or the duration of the Buddhist dispensation, the Sasana, or the duration during which the scriptures are still available. No, it speaks only about the duration of the pure, right, of the true Dhamma. And in addition to the above passage, there is also a sutta, it's called the Satthamma Padirupaka Sutta. And that sutta shows the reasons for the gradual disappearance 
of the true Dharma. Venerable Mahakasapa, he asked, what's the cause, Lord? He is addressing the Buddha. What is the cause? What is the reason? Why earlier there were fewer training rules and yet more monks were established in final gnosis, in liberation. Whereas now there are more training rules, yet just a few monks are established in liberation. So Mahakasapa was puzzled about that. Then the Buddha replies to him, that's the way it is, Kasapa. When beings are degenerating and the true Dhamma is disappearing, there are more draining rules, yet fewer monks established in final gnosis. There is no disappearance of the true Dhamma as long as the counterfeit of the true Dhamma has not arisen in the world, the Buddha says. As long as no counterfeit of the Dhamma, a fake Dhamma, so to speak, has not arisen, the true Dhamma will not disappear. But there is the disappearance of the true Dhamma when a counterfeit of the true Dhamma has arisen in the world. Just as there is no disappearance of gold, uh, as long as counterfeit, fake gold, you know, artificial thing, it looks like gold, but it's just like yellow paint, as long as that has not arisen, we can trust, oh, this is really gold. And when there's a lot, lot of counterfeit gold, uh, then gold, uh, people will lose the interest and will, gold will lose their value because uh, it's difficult to determine. So as long as uh, no counterfeit of the gold has arisen, uh, the true Dhamma, uh, the value will maintain. But that there is the disappearance of gold when a counterfeit of gold has arisen in the world. In the same way, there is no disappearance of the true Dhamma as long as the counterfeit of the true Dhamma has not arisen. And then the Buddha closes off and says that it's not the earth property, you know, it's not the earth that makes the true Dhamma disappear. It's not the water or fire or wind. So it's not because the scriptures are being burned or something like that. It's worthless people who arise right here within the Sangha, so to speak, who make the true Dhamma disappear. So it's actually not from outside. I know also even here in Malaysia, often uh, Buddhists are comparing different Buddhist schools or uh, Buddhism versus Christianity versus Islam, who gains more in numbers, who has less numbers. But the Buddha says, it's not from outside that the true Dhamma will disappear. The true Dhamma doesn't disappear uh, in this way. It's from inside, from right here. You can say from within the Sangha, uh, since the Buddha was talking to monks, that the true Dhamma will disappear because of the counterfeit Dhamma. The true Dhamma doesn't disappear the way a boat sinks all at once. Meaning to say, it doesn't disappear just suddenly, but gradually over time. Um. Then the Buddha says, uh, there is the case where the monks, nuns, uh, male and female followers, lay followers, when they live without respect, uh, without reference for the teacher, for the Dhamma, and for the Sangha, and for concentration. Uh, these are five downward leading qualities that tend to the confusion and disappearance of the true Dhamma. But then the Buddha also says, but these other five qualities uh, tend to the stability, the non-confusion, the non-disappearance of the true Dhamma. Which five? Mm -hmm. So there's the case where the monks, nuns, male and female lay followers, and they practice and they live with respect, with deference for the teacher, meaning the, the Buddha. They live with respect, with deference for the Dhamma, for the Sangha, for the training and for Samadhi, concentration. So it's interesting that the Dhamma doesn't disappear uh, just 
out of the blue, but it's actually because we do not uphold the Dhamma, the training, the practice, and that's why it disappears. And then people won't be inspired by it. If we don't practice it, others also won't be interested to follow along, and then it uh, disappears and loses relevance in the world. And it's also interesting that the Buddha was not particularly concerned about the disappearance of the Buddhist dispensation or the scriptures themselves, but about the disappearance of the true, unadulterated, pure Dhamma. No. So I think the reason for this could be that because once the true Dhamma has disappeared, uh, then there's no more possibility for liberation. And since liberation, the ending of suffering, is the only reason why a Buddha teaches the Dhamma in the first place, so then the ending of the true Dhamma is the most important transition point. Uh, by the way, the term sasana, uh, since we also just earlier we spoke about the disappearance of the sasana, uh, originally in the discourses, uh, the sasana refers to the ninefold classification of scriptures. Uh, it's a different textual styles, you can say. Uh, one of them is called sutta, the other one is called gaya which is mixed prose, uh, prose and verse mixes, mixed. Then Vahya Karana, exegesis, or verses, like the Tamabada, it's just verses, gathas, uh, inspired utterances, or marvelous saying, or marvelous things that occurred to the Buddha, or sayings of the Blessed One, birth stories, and analytical teachings. So this ninefold classification system uh, was called uh, the ninefold sasana. Anyway, uh, the Bali commentaries and also sub commentaries have worked out various models to show how the gradual disappearance of the Buddha's dispensation may unfold. And it is noteworthy here that there is actually a lot of uh, variation here. Um, uh, for example, the commentaries on the Vinaya Pitaka, on the rules for monks and nuns, the commentaries on, on that text, and also the Anguttara Nikaya commentary, they say that there will be 1,000 years for Arahants who possess analytical insights, Bhattisambhida. So for the first 1,000 years of the Buddha's dispensation, such Arahants can be found. And then there will be 1,000 years afterwards where the Arahants don't have these special analytical insights anymore, but they can still be Arahants. Then comes another thousand years for non-returners. You cannot become an Arahant anymore, but uh, non-return is the highest. And then a thousand years, then uh, for once returners, down, down to another thousand for stream winner, stream enterers. So after these 5,000 years of where it's possible to penetrate the two Dhamma, then only the accomplishment in the texts, the Pariyati, will remain. The learning, memorizing, but monks uh, won't practice and put it into practice anymore. Then after that, the texts also disappear. And then in the end, only the signs will continue for a long time. And during this period, the only good action that is left is making gifts, dana, to those who wear, the sutta says, or the community says, a, who wear a yellow strip of cloth around the necks. So this is the only identification mark of being monastics. They don't wear robes anymore, but they only wear a piece of cloth around the neck, then you would know, maybe, <laughs> that this is a monastic. So this would uh, correspond to the age of generosity at the end. So where are we now, according to that scheme? I said 1,000 years first, already passed. Another 1,000 years, also already passed. Because the Buddha 
passed away already 2,500 years ago, more than that. So we're already in the third age, the third period here. This means our hardship would not even be possible anymore, according to that system of classification. You can at most become a non-returner nowadays. Mm -hmm. And then there's another commentary, uh, the commentary to the Anagata Vangsa. There, the sasana is said to disappear in different five stages. The first one is the disappearance of analytical insights. That is kind of the same as before. Then the disappearance of paths and fruits. This means after a thousand years, now already paths and fruits already have disappeared. You cannot become even a sotapanna. Then the third stage, uh, the disappearance of the practice. So even though you cannot attain anything, people would still practice at first, but then that also disappears. And then eventually also the disappearance of the texts, of the learning, of the pariyati, and then of the sangha itself. So according to this scheme, where are we now? Yeah. Now we are in the disappearance of the practice. Paths and fruits supposedly not even possible anymore, but can still practice. But even that is currently uh, supposedly already disappearing. And we are heading towards a period where only learning and memorizing is possible. But currently there's still practice, but already in the face of disappearing. Whew. That sounds quite serious, isn't it? <laughs> well, don't worry. <laughs> None of this is found in the Bali discourses and their parallels. Uh, so it is only in, only in quotation marks, but uh, the, in the early Buddhist teachings, these classification systems are not found. And as I said earlier, the Buddha actually spoke about the disappearance of the Satthamma, of the true Dhamma. He didn't actually lighten outline uh, how the sasana will disappear. Maybe that was not even much of his concern. Because once people cannot get liberated anymore, it doesn't matter whether there's still some texts around or not, it doesn't fulfill its purpose. Uh, so anyway, uh, we can take it maybe with a grain of salt. But I would say that a belief in, uh, in these doctrines uh, can be quite consequential because if we put off and, and understand that nowadays we cannot attain anything anyway, why should I practice? Why make an effort? Why meditate? Right? Maybe for a pleasant abiding in the here and now, but then the whole bigger picture is missing. And it has happened in Buddhist history that until Hmm, for many last hundreds of years, maybe even more than that, uh, even the monks were not practicing anymore, not to speak of laity. So in the early 19th century in Sri Lanka and other Theravada countries, there was a general understanding that they were still teaching the Dhamma, but uh, practice was not regarded as fruitful. And that has changed only later in the 19th century. In 20th century. Uh, I will come back to that a bit later. So the belief in, uh, in the inability in attainments is actually a very detrimental belief. Because if it's still possible, but you believe it's not, then there's a high chance that a person will not practice and will probably miss out on the good fruits and benefits that otherwise could have been obtained. So in case you want to go even deeper with this topic, uh, there's one publication you can see. It's called The Disappearance of the True Dhamma, uh, Bali Commentary Interpretations by Dr. Toshiji Endo. He's a very good scholar and he's wrote a whole book on this topic. Anyway, uh, my personal opinion uh, is this. Uh, just maybe one word here, a small disclaimer. Throughout this talk, whenever I say my personal opinion, this is not meant to imply that I have 
attained stream entry or any of the higher Aryan stages, nor is it meant to imply that I have not. I am only sharing uh, the way I understand the Dhamma, as it appears to me uh, from the my perspective of the discourses, as well as other texts, and then also from my own observations, from having lived in monasteries and meditation centers for more than 15 years now. And then also from conversations with other practitioners. Yeah. So I think that even at the Buddha's time, it wasn't so easy actually to become an Arahant. And considering the hundred thousands of people that the Buddha actually met during his lifetime, it was only a tiny fraction of those who became Arahants. So the fact that the Arahants are hard to come by these days may not be much different from the Buddha's own lifetime. But then, how about stream entry? Is this still possible? Some say yes, some say no. And the reasons that are sometimes given, why nowadays it seems almost impossible or very difficult to become a stream enterer, at least a stream enterer, the reasons are usually one of these three reasons. Either that human beings uh, are not of the same quality as they used to be. Hmm. So nowadays, the, the current generation supposedly is not of the same quality as those who have lived uh, at that time. Another reason, sometimes given, is that uh, we practice incorrectly. It's another possibility, right? So many years have passed, we don't know what is really the Buddha's teaching, so many teachings are around. Nowadays, even on Facebook and WhatsApp, every time with quotes and underneath it says the Buddha, then we practice accordingly. Are we still practicing correctly? So this could be another reason. And the third reason that um, I see also possibility for that is that one may overestimate of what it means to be a stream enterer and the preconditions for its attainment. And in this way, the bar may be even higher than it uh, already is by uh, overestimating or having a not accurate judgment of what it means to be a stream enterer and what it means to have attained the stream. So let us come back to the first of those claims and aspects where it said that human beings might not be of the same quality as they used to be. It's a fair point. Now, I personally think human beings these days are not lacking any faculties, right? We still have ears, we still have eyes, a mind, consciousness, feelings, perceptions. That's quite the same. Genetics haven't changed in such a short time. Yes, 2,500 years, but short, this is short in evolutionary terms. Evo evolution doesn't work so quickly. So in terms of physicality and genetic makeup, uh, we're pretty much the same, uh, like the cave people. <laughs> Not much has changed since that. And I would even say that the impact of the modern 21st century lifestyle is also difficult to evaluate. On one side, there's more access to a multiplicity of sense pleasures, more than ever before in history. Right? So you can go out and eat Italian food in the morning, and Mexican for lunch, and Japanese for dinner. <laughs> right? So sense pleasures are just much more available these days. So this could be one factor. Also, we have maybe more stress on the workplace these days, or more distractions, especially due to social media. On the other hand, the average lifespan nowadays is much higher than that of 2,500 years ago. Healthcare is better, which means not only uh, a longer life, but also more life quality until old age. 
where you can actually practice. And also we have much more free time than earlier generations. You don't have to spend the whole day on the field, uh, working on the field, getting the crops, and then sometimes there's still a famine. So field work, which used to be a main occupation for us humans for a long time, uh, consumed almost a whole day. It's not that six hours a day or after eight hours you go back and then that's it. <laughs> so we have actually more time nowadays. And most importantly, nowadays we have access to the Buddha's teachings, which is actually easier than ever before. No, at the Buddha's time, if you want to hear the Dhamma, you have to find someone who has memorized the Dhamma. Because, well, they didn't have YouTube uh, channels or Facebook or whatever, uh, nor books. So you had to find somebody who knows the Dhamma and has memorized it. And some can memorize some passages, others can memorize others, but it's not just at the tip of your fingers. No. So nowadays, access to the Dhamma is much easier than ever before. So in conclusion, it's not obvious to me that humans nowadays lack any faculties, or even that the environment is less ideal for awakening than the period of ancient India. In some respects, maybe yes, but then in others, it seems even better suited than before. So that first point, I don't think, is very conclusive. But then we also had uh, another point, which was the suggestion that the practice itself uh, may be incorrect. The way we are practicing these days may not be uh, in line with the Buddhist teachings. And there can be various reasons why nowadays we may practice differently from how people practiced at the Buddha's time. One reason can be that the texts that we have these days are completely corrupt. Therefore, we don't know how to practice correctly. It's a possibility, right, in theory. Well, so if the texts are completely all over the place, uh, how to know? Then another possibility is that maybe some of the texts are corrupt and have undergone some evolution, but then we focus not on those good texts that are still available and that have not uh, undergone some evolution, but we focus on those later texts that have undergone some transformation rather than the original texts, rather than the unadulterated texts. So even though both are available, some early, some late teachings, but if you choose to focus on the later teachings, but then also we might end up in some cases to practice incorrectly. Or another option could be why somebody could practice incorrectly is we might just ignore the text altogether and follow maybe a contemporary teacher's method, which may or may not be in line with the teaching of the Buddha, the Dhamma, as he has taught it. Oh. So also nowadays, I think, got a, a large amount of uh, devotees and practitioners, um, maybe not necessarily go to the source and to the Buddha's teachings directly, uh, to the, maybe to the discourses, to the suttas, but they will follow a contemporary teacher's style and method, which may or may not be in line with the teachings of the Buddha. Or other option, uh, we can just uh, ignore the text and follow our own intuition. This is also not uncommon. Uh, our own beliefs and conditioning or reasoning, which also may or may not be in line with the Dhamma, the teachings of the Buddha. Well, actually, you know, uh, if uh, I look at it in this way, if our own views, beliefs, and reasoning, and our own sense of logic, if our methodology would be correct already, we would have attained Nibbana 
long ago. The fact that we are still around in samsara shows us that we need some guidance. And ideally the guidance of a fully awakened one, of a Samasam Buddha. So, as we know from comparative studies, uh, the Buddhist texts have indeed undergone some uh, evolution. But with a bit of uh, detective work, we can still identify with sufficient accuracy which of the teachings that we encounter uh, under the umbrella of Buddhism, which of them are early and which of them are late. So it's a bit like Sherlock Holmes. Yeah? <laughs> you have to, to piece together all the different puzzle pieces. And then in this way, there's actually a fair chance that we can filter out and detect what is actually the root teachings of the Buddha. And there's a whole field of study that is actually dedicated towards this process. Nowadays we call it early Buddhism. So early Buddhism is a methodology where the Pali texts are put side by side with other early texts like the Chinese Agamas from a different schools of the early, there were at one time even 18 early schools of Buddhism uh, throughout the first few hundred years after the Buddha's Pari Nibbana that have developed. But these were still early schools and they all memorized the Dhamma, maintained the suttas, the Vinaya. And by putting these, side, these texts from different schools side by side, we can sometimes see, oh, texts that are very similar or exactly the same everywhere, we would say they have a high probability of authenticity. Whereas texts that are maybe only found in one version, but maybe other three or four versions don't contain that passage, uh, then it seems there's something, something wrong here. Or maybe this, uh, something is missing in one version, which is included in all others. Then there's a high chance that in the early stages of oral transmission of the text, one recital lineage could just have forgotten about this passage. But by putting them side by side, we can identify, oh, I see that the Tibetan version has something that has been dropped from the Chinese version. Or maybe the Pali version got the sequence wrong somewhere. What should be number three in our list is, what is it number three in our list should actually be the first one in the list and not just number three. So by comparing with different versions, sometimes we can get a more accurate picture of the most likely early aspects and early teachings of the Buddha. Because if all schools contain the same thing, well, it points that they have a similar core, a similar root from which uh, these schools have developed. Whereas teachings that are found only in one school, even if it's the Theravada school, uh, we can be a bit suspicious. Where does it come from? Anyway, uh, if you're really interested in this topic, uh, I personally uh, find it very fascinating. Uh, you can uh, look up or listen to a talk I gave a while ago. Uh, I think it has been uploaded to YouTube. Uh, it's called, What is Early Buddhism? Uh, so just key it in. Uh, you will probably find it quite quickly. And if you're interested, you can check it out more in full there. But even without comparative study, and even without knowing Bali language, taking the English Sutta translations fully on board, especially those from Bhikkhu Bodhi, and then practicing accordingly, these texts are sufficient for the attainment of all four stages of awakening all the way to Arahantship. So nowadays we have so good translations, you don't even have to be a Bali scholar. Yes, it can help you to verify, get some subtle nuances, but these are generally not so essential. If you just take the suttas as a whole, you're pretty safe. And if you practice accordingly, uh, that's more than sufficient to what we need for liberation. Of course, this will help us only if we are willing to take the Buddhist teachings as our guide and are not just blindly following our own views or those of 
maybe contemporary teachers. After all, who is the first refuge? Huh? It is not Archan this, or Lumpur that, or Sayado U so and so. No, it's Lumpur Gotama. Sayado U Gotama, Swami Rahanse Mahanayaka Tero, is our refuge. Huh? And the teachings that he has left behind for our benefit. So, Sayado U Gotama, Lumpur Gotama refers to the Buddha, <laughs> obviously. He is the first refuge. So if we use the early teachings of the Buddha as our uh, guide, then we actually ensured to practice correctly. And various stages of awakening become accessible. Uh, remember, uh, a bit earlier we also said there's a chance that one may overestimate what it means to be a stream enterer. This is like the uh, third uh, possibility of why nowadays there are less stream enterers than before, or less aryas. So what we think are the requisites and prerequisites for becoming a stream enterer may be different from how it was understood at the time of the Buddha. And this is probably the broadest and largest category where we encounter different perspectives. So let let me break it down into a few sub-questions and a few sub-categories that can arise in this context. Now, one is, what is the literal meaning uh, of the term Sotapanna? This is the first thing that we need to verify. And we'll go through these points uh, shortly. I'll just give you an overview now. Secondly, we we'll can discuss uh, what is the level of virtue that is sort of on our processes. Also a question that can come up is, what's the level of samadhi, of concentration, that is sort of on our processes? Are jhanas necessary or not? Can a sort of get greedy or even angry? Is this possible? Or can a sort of on still take things personally, as if they were a self? Is that possible? Can he identify with himself? Doesn't he have right view? And also, what are the qualities of a stream enderer according to the discourses? Then, a few more interesting questions that can come to mind is, has a Sotopana seen and experienced Nibbana? I don't know. It's something worth while investigating. There have been different opinions on that. Or is it possible to overestimate one's attainments? Can one believe that one is a Sotopanna, but in reality one is not? And if that is possible, is it also possible to underestimate one's attainment? Is it possible that a person attains stream entry but doesn't know it? So these are all uh, questions that can come up in, in this context. And I think that could be worthwhile uh, exploring together, if you like. So let us first maybe just have a look at what is the literal meaning of the term uh, Sotopanna. So Sotopanna is a compound. The word Sotopanna is a compound that is comprised of Sota, plus apanna. Apanna means fallen into or entered upon a certain path or course. Fallen into, entered upon. It's the meaning of apanna. And soda means stream. And in some contexts, it means ear. For example, uh, when the Buddha speaks about the types of consciousness, the six types of consciousness. The ear gets in contact with sounds and ear consciousness arises. So here the term sota is used. Sota vinyana, ear consciousness. So sota also refers to the ear organ. Oh. So even though some have suggested that therefore we should translate the term sotabana as 
ear enderer, not a stream enderer, but as ear enderer, because in the suttas it's often after hearing the Dhamma for the first time from the Buddha that people became stream enderers, that they became sota banners. So, therefore, the suggestion that therefore it should be the ear enderer. But this hypothesis is in tension with a sutta in Samyutta Nikaya, which is Samyutta 55.38, where the Buddha says to Venerable Sariputta, Sariputta, this is it. The stream, the stream, stream, the Bali word is Sota, Sota. What now, Sariputta, is the stream? The noble eightfold path, whenever, sir, Sariputta answers. The noble eightfold path, whenever, sir, is the stream. That is, right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, mindfulness, and concentration. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sariputta, the Buddha said. The noble path, noble eightfold path, is the stream. The eight path factors. Sariputta, this is said. A stream enterer, a stream enterer, a sotobana. What now, Sariputta, is a stream enterer? Then Sariputta answers correctly, one who possesses this noble eightfold path, whenever said. This is called a stream enterer. Samyutta Nikaya 55.5. So it's actually the noble eightfold path that carries a person forward. That is the stream that the Buddha is talking about here. Not nothing to do with the ear, right? It's about the the stream, the the path on which one walks, and the path, eight path factors. There's another sutta where uh, the Buddha says because Whatever great rivers, big long river, there are. That is the Ganges River of India, the Yamuna, the Achiravati, the Sarapu, the Mahi. They all slant, slope, and incline towards the east. So do a bhikkhu who develops and cultivates the noble eightfold path, slants, slopes, and inclines towards Nibbana. Samyutta Nikaya 45.92 until 96. So you can see here the stream, that the Buddha speaks about of a stream, a river that uh, inclines in one direction and carries a person along, uh, whoever enters that stream. And this is exactly uh, how this imagery is meant. Uh, so it can take uh, and up to at most seven lifetimes until that stream, the current, has moved the person towards the destination, the final goal, Nibbana. Just like the rivers, there's another sutta where the Buddha says, all rivers have the ocean as the final destination. So in the same way, the stream, the current, once a person has entered the stream, uh, you won't turn around anymore and then next day, uh, you become a Christian, and then you go to India, become inspired by a Hindu teacher. No. Once the person has entered his stream, the destination, the current, the noble eightfold path will carry him f forward towards the, the liberation, towards Nirvana. And that can take up to seven lifetimes, and within those seven lifetimes, there is no more rebirth, in the lower planes of existence. So from the above, we can understand that the proper translation of Sotapanna is actually not ear enderer, but stream enderer, because it refers to someone who has entered upon the stream of Tama, the noble eightfold path, the current of which will lead him all the way to the ocean of Nibbana. I remember a bit earlier, we also saw the question, what is the level of virtue that a Sotabana possesses? Hmm. The level of virtue of a Sotabana is, he possesses the virtues 
that are dear to the noble ones, Aria Kandani Silani, that are unbroken, undorn, unblemished, unmodeled, freed, freeing, sorry, braced by the wise, ungrasped, and leading to concentration. So these virtues, this is a Sotapanna's virtue, the virtues that are dear to the noble ones. So then, uh, what are these, these virtues that are dear to the noble ones? Again, we are back to detective work. Uh, it's actually not defined in this Sutta or any Sutta exactly what that refers to, at least not in a direct manner. But we can get a clue from other suttas. For example, there's one sutta where the Buddha explains, householder, when five fearful animosities, five fearful animosities have subsided, have been put aside in the noble disciple, and he possesses the four factors of stream entry, and he has clearly seen and thoroughly penetrated with wisdom the noble method. If he wishes, he could by himself declare of himself, I am one who is finished with hell, finished with the animal realm, finished with the domain of ghosts, finished with the plane of misery, the bad destinations, the nether world. I am a stream enderer, no longer bound to the nether world, fixed in destiny, with enlightenment as my destination. So first interesting thing here to note is, you can verify that on your own, you know. It's not that you uh, need to run to some senior monks or some clairvoyant monks who can verify it for you. He says, uh, a person himself can declare and understand that on his own, that he is uh, a Sotapanna. And then at the beginning of this list, he mentioned about the five fearful animosities uh, that have subsided in a noble disciple. Uh, so what are these five fearful animosities that have subsided? Well, in the same sutta, just a bit below, what are the five fearful animosities? Householder, one who destroys life. Uh, he engenders on account of such behavior, fearful animosity pertaining to the present life and fearful animosity pertaining to the future life, right? Because if a person who kills another person or animals, uh, people will be uh, see him as an enemy and will be afraid of him and will have fear of him. So he engenders, he arouses fear in others. So this is what actually a stream manager has put aside. Uh, the killing of living beings, in short. Uh, also the same, he also does not uh, arouse the same things, animosity for the future life. And he experiences mental pain and displeasure uh, in himself and in others on account of, of killing. Thus for one uh, who abstains from destroying life, this fearful animosity has subsided. And then the same is said about one who takes what is not given, about stealing, but one who engages in sexual misconduct, who speaks falsely, right, a deliberate lie, and who indulges in wine, liquor, and intoxicants that are basis for negligence. All of those engender on account of such behavior, fearful animosity pertaining to the present life and also pertaining to the future life. Mm -hmm. and one experiences mental pain and displeasure. So, whereas for one who abstains from these five things by undertaking the five precepts and maintaining the five precepts, um, this uh, fearful animosity has subsided. These are the five fearful animosities that have subsided. So, uh, here in the Sutta, where he speaks directly about the Sutta Banner, he mentions explicitly the five trainings, the five precepts. Hmm. Then there's actually also, um, what was the Sutta number? I think I didn't mention it earlier. 
I do have to set the number somewhere. I think it's still bad of some Udernikaya 55.1, if you want to look it up just for reference. Some Udernikaya 55.1. Okay. There's a, another Sutta in some Udernikaya in the some Udernikaya 12.41, where the Buddha says, he possesses the virtues dear to, to, to the noble ones that are unbroken, undorn, unblemished, unmodeled, freeing, braced by the wise, ungrasped, and leading to samadhi. So we can see here that the Arya in the Sotapanna is actually not just sometimes keeping the precepts and sometimes not, but he keeps them undorn, unbroken, in a very meticulous manner. So the sealer, especially with regards to five trainings, is very strong. Oh. And the commentary to this passage also explains that the virtues dear to the noble ones, and the Arya Kandani Silani, and uh, it refers to the five precepts, which the noble ones do not forsake even when they pass on to a new existence. So even if you become a stream mentor now, and then a reborn somewhere else, uh, the person would still maintain, just naturally, the five precepts. So these virtues, according to the commentary, are also ungrasped, aparamatta, in the sense that they are not adhered to with craving or wrong view. No. However, it's interesting because you see there's another list of unwholesome actions in Anguttara Nikaya 10.176, but the Buddha mentions 10 unwholesome causes of actions. Three by body, four by speech, three by mind. What are they? Killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, by body, then by word, by speech. The unwholesome actions there that I mentioned are lying, same as before, but also uh, harsh, harsh speech and divisive speech and idle chatter. So all four types of wrong speech. And then uh, also three types of mental karma, like being covetous about the property of other people. It's just mentally, you know, it's not physical action. Or uh, wishing for the death of another person, that kind of ill will uh, that you wish for the death of somebody else. Yeah, that is also very unwholesome mental action and the holding of wrong views, like denying the law of karma. And in this sutta, the Buddha explains that it is because people engage in these 10 courses of unwholesome karma that hell, the animal realm, and this fear of hungry ghosts uh, and other uh, bad planes of existence uh, are seen. So then now the question can arise, how do we reconcile this sutta with the earlier one, where only for the five precepts have been singled out with explicit reference to the Sotapanna? Here it doesn't speak about the Sotapanna, but the other one did. So, but if these 10 actions can uh, never ever be committed by a stream enderer, why are they then not mentioned also in the other discourse? On the other side, since the Buddha says, um, a stream enjoy cannot go to the lower planes of existence. Shouldn't he also abstain from these 10 causes of actions? Because they are said to lead to lower planes of existence. So this includes not only lying, but even harsh speech, or even useless talk, you know, idle chatter. Talk about politics or uh, society. Uh, famous people, movie stars nowadays. Now, this kind of conversation is called idle chatter. So a stream enter, if you take the 10 uh, causes of action, uh, then it would suggest a stream enter cannot engage in any of those either. So how to reconcile uh, these two discourses? As I said, the one with the 10 list of 10 doesn't have any reference to stream entry, whereas the other one does. 
And so the answer to this puzzle uh, may be found in the third discourse, which is the Lona Kapala Sutta, Anguttara Nikaya 3.100. I'll read out a short passage for you. So we are trying to solve, just to summarize, we are trying to solve the puzzle. Is it five precepts that the Sotopana is meticulous and unbroken, or is it the ten unwholesome causes of action? Because the ten unwholesome causes of action are also said to lead to a bad re rebirth in the lower planes of existence, and then shouldn't the Sotopana also uh, abstain from those? Lona Kapala Sutta explains, here because some person has ended, uh, has created a trifling, a small amount of bad karma, yet it leads him to hell. While some other person has created exactly the same small bad karma, yet it is to be experienced in this very life, without even a single slight residue being seen, much less abundant residue. So two people, they're doing the same unwholesome action, uh, maybe killing of a mosquito. One of them gets a very severe result, bad rebirth on account of that. The other one gets a slight result in the present life, but uh, not much. So what kind of person creates trifling karma that leads him to hell? Here, some person is undeveloped in body, in virtuous behavior, in mind and wisdom. Uh, when the Buddha here explains uh, undeveloped in body, it actually refers to sense restraint. And then undeveloped in virtue, undeveloped in mind refers to concentration. We know this from other suttas. And also undeveloped in wisdom. He is limited and has a mean character, and he dwells in suffering. When such a person creates trifling bad karma, it leads him to hell. Okay. But then what kind of person uh, is the other one who creates exactly the same trifling bad karma, and yet it is to be experienced in this very life without any residue to be seen afterwards? Here some person is developed in body, meaning sense restraint. He is developed in virtue, in mind and wisdom. Yeah. So in sense restraint, virtue, concentration and wisdom. He is unlimited and has a lofty character, and he dwells without measure. Probably this refers to the Brahma Viharas. And such a person creates exactly the same trifling bad karma. It is to be experienced in this very life without even a slight residue being seen, much less a lot of residue. So a trifling act done by this sort of individual is experienced in the here and now. And then the Buddha gives this famous simile of the lump of sword. Have you heard about this? The lump of sword simile? Uh, he says, you know, there's a person and you take a lump of salt and you put it into a cup of water. And then this whole cup of water, <laughs> of course, become very salty, completely unusable, undrinkable. Uh, yeah, so it's very bad. The lump of salt actually symbolizes unwholesome karma, uh, unwholesome deed. But then another person has the same amount of salt, but he throws it into the Ganges River. Will that river now become salty? No. Why not? Well, because it's diluted, we would say, isn't it? So in the same way, these qualities that we just mentioned earlier, uh, development in virtue, in concentration, in wisdom, in sense restraint. Uh, these qualities dilute uh, the effects of the unwholesome karma. It's not by accumulating a lot of wholesome karma, as it's commonly misunderstood, this simile. Not just being more generous or being more of service. It's not this kind of wholesome karma that that person has. It's the spiritual qualities of virtue, concentration, wisdom, dhamma practice, that is the thing that dilutes the effect of the unwholesome karma. So 
while an uninstructed worldling, a Bhutujana, is in completely undeveloped in those states, the Aryas from stream entry onwards, they are already to some degree developed in sense restraint, very developed, fully developed in virtue. They also have some Samadhi probably, we'll come back to that later, and also wisdom. So a trifling, occasional, small, unwholesome action, uh, like idle chatter, or maybe a harsh word spoken too quickly, uh, cannot lead for him to a severe result in the future, uh, because of his spiritual qualities, that they loot like the lump of salt in the Ganges River. Now some have objected a little bit to that. They say that this passage applies only to Arahants. But let's keep in mind that the past unwholesome deeds that would otherwise have produced rebirth in the lower planes of existence uh, also applies to uh, the lower areas, right? Because before some human body becomes a stream enderer or once returner, that person in the past also will have done deeds that would otherwise have produced uh, bad results even in the lower planes of existence. So by stream entry and higher attainments, that karma will not be able to produce that kind of rebirth. So it gets diluted, the simile of the sword. So I would very much say that the simile of the sword is not limited only for Arahans, uh, but also to the lower Aryan stages, who also have some of those qualities, maybe not to the same extent as the Arahant, of course, but already. Also the phrase, when such a person creates exactly the same trifling bad karma, it is to be experienced in this very life. This can also not apply to Arahants, because Arahants do not create even a trifling amount of bad karma. They only have past bad karma in their karmic store, but they don't create new bad karma. So in this way, we can conclude that in terms of virtue, a stream enderer is perfect, unbroken, undefiled with regard to the five precepts, but can from time to time accumulate unwholesome karma in other areas. But that karma does not lead to a bad rebirth due to his spiritual development, which dilutes the effects of that karma. Remember the mass murderer Angulimala, huh, who killed so many people, and then he became an Arahant, and he could not ripen, he could not experience the results, the severe results that he would otherwise have gotten if he would not have attained liberation. So surely a very bad rebirth would have awaited him. Even though, even during his life as a monk for the rest of his life, after Arahantship, uh, he would still occasionally get the results of his past bad deeds, uh, where people would throw things out the window, they would land on him, and would get injured, sometimes on arms round. So one time he went to the Buddha and complained a little bit, or reported, and the Buddha said to him, bear it, you're experiencing now the results of what you would have, other have otherwise have experienced uh, in much more severe forms. So again, this is an example where the karma, the unwholesome karma is diluted due to the spiritual maturity of the person. So I think with this to me, uh, this question about the, what's the level of virtue, what is the virtue dear to the noble ones that the uh, Sotapanna possesses, I would say five precepts, meticulous, uh, no breach, no break. Uh, then the other forms of unwholesome actions, he can from time to time fall there, but of course he will make remedy and uh, improve further. Okay. Uh, let me see what's the time. Okay. Still have a bit of time. Uh, another interesting question. I know that many have asked me before, uh, what's the level of samadhi? What's the level of concentration uh, that a Sotapanna possesses? Are jhanas necessary or not? 
Right. So first off, maybe the commentarial terms, momentary concentration, kanika samadhi, and also excess concentration, upachara samadhi, are not found within the early discourses. So in the suttas and early discourses, instead, right concentration, samasamadhi, is consistently defined either as the four jhanas or as one-pointedness of mind, citta se kakkata. Either of these two definitions you find in the suttas. This is how samasamadhi is defined. So, the sutta where the Buddha says, they are because these seven accessories of concentration. What seven? Right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, and right mindfulness. So these are the accessories. So these are the seven path factors, isn't it? One-pointedness of mind, Chitta Sekakata, equipped with these seven factors, is called noble right concentration, with its supports and with its accessories. So, Ekakata, one-pointedness of mind, together with the other seven path factors, uh, is called right concentration. And so you can see here, it has the role where normally the four jhanas are mentioned, here uh, Chitta Sekakada is mentioned. Uh, let us speak a little bit about the meaning of this term. If you look closely, Chitta Sekakada means Chitta, uh, and then Eka, Chitta means refers to the mind, and Eka is one, and Akka uh, can be a, a point or a place. And you could translate it as one-pointedness or one-placedness of mind. The, the da at the end is just a suffix. So, but it's important to understand, it's not about the object. It's not that the mind is paying attention just to one object. A kakada, a chitta se kakada, does not mean you have to focus on one object only. Uh, that you can get samadhi. Because it's actually chitta, the, the mind that is one-pointed, that is composed and unified, not the object. So it's a mind that is not scattered, that is not going outward, that is not distracted. But, it, but what is the object is not mentioned. So it's the quality of the mind that is unified, one, eka. And also good to understand that since right concentration is always defined as the four jhanas or singleness of mind, so this can mean that these two things are different, so are two options of samasamadhi, or that they refer to one and the same thing. And there's actually another term that is uh, synonymous to one-pointedness of mind, that is a synonym to ekakata. The term is in Bali is eko di bhava, unification, or having become one. Very similar. And I would say that the circumstance that unification, eko di bhava, is mentioned even in the stock formula of the second jhana, that suggests that this aspect, this quality, the ekakata, eko di bhava, are not pre jhanic forms of samadhi, but they are part of the jhana itself. No? So these two terms are kind of interchangeably. So now, does this stream enter possess all eight path factors? Somebody might say. No? Noble Eightfold Path, whatever sir, is the stream. Samyutin so Nikaya 55.5. The Noble Eightfold Path, whenever sir, is the stream. That is, right view, right intention, right speech, action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and concentration. So this noble eightfold path is the stream of the stream enterer. But let's keep in mind that the 
stream, the noble eightfold path, needs to be developed. So a stream enterer, when you say a stream enterer already has the jhanas, then it kind of implies almost as if he already has it completely developed the noble eightfold path. But actually the stream enterer still has to walk that path and follow that stream until he reaches Nibbana, isn't it? Like we have heard earlier uh, from the river that gradually will lead towards uh, the larger river or towards the ocean and leans and bends in one direction. So the Noble Eightfold Bath is not yet fulfilled in the stream enderer in terms of accomplishment. Yes, he possesses it in the defectors, meaning uh, he knows what is the path and he has embarked on the journey and he is on the path and he will be carried forward. But he's not yet there and the path factors are not yet fully developed. So therefore the suggestion that just because Samasamadhi, usually the four jhanas, is one of the eight path factors and that the stream enderer uh, has embarked on that path does not mean that they are all, all fully developed. Otherwise it would be an arahant already. So speaking about com accomplishments on the path, uh, let me put up the slide here. There are different stages, as we know, and the Arya stages, we can roughly separate them into the stream enderer, the once returner, the non-returner, and the Arahant. And there's an interesting discourse where it says that a stream enderer is one who fulfills virtuous behavior, but cultivates concentration and wisdom only to a moderate extent. You see? So his virtue is already fulfilled. We said already earlier. But then his samadhi and banya is only cultivated moderately so far. And the same is actually said about the once returner whose virtue again is fulfilled, but the samadhi and wisdom is uh, only moderately developed. But then if you look at the non-returner, he already fulfills not just virtue, but also concentration, but still needs to cultivate wisdom, which is still only on a moderate extent developed. So it's actually only the non-returner who has accomplishment in Samadhi, who is, has fulfilled his power of Samadhi. And lastly, the Arahant, he fulfills, of course, all three, virtue, concentration, and wisdom. So if we put this heavy burden and say, oh, even a Sotapanna, you already need the jhanas, the pinnacle of Sama Samadhi, uh, then that would not fit so nicely with the Sutta, where it says actually uh, his Samadhi is only moderately developed. And it's only the non-returner and Arahant who have uh, fulfilled the Samadhi practice. So found that quite interesting. Uh, it's a good sutta to keep in mind and to come back to from time to time. It's a very useful one. Um, Ankutra 3.87. And then also the Buddha asked, how Nandia is a noble disciple, one who dwells negligently? So there seems to be the possibility to be negligent. Here, uh, a noble disciple possesses confirmed confidence in the Buddha, but he does not make further effort for solitude by day or by night, uh, or he does not go into seclusion. And when he in this way dwells negligently, negligently there is no gladness in him, so to say. And when there's no gladness, then there's also no rapture, no beauty. When there's no rapture, there's no tranquility. And when there's no tranquility, he dwells in suffering, in dukkha. The mind of one who suffers does not become concentrated, the Sutta says, because actually sukha 
Happiness is the precursor for Samadhi, not Dukkha. Then, when the mind is not concentrated, phenomena do not become manifest. Because phenomena do not become manifest, is reckoned as one who dwells negligently. So this indicates that it would be the job of a stream enderer to go into seclusion, not be negligent, and to learn to develop the jhanas. But in this example, since, since he is not energetic and negligent, he instead dwells without samadhi. So again, we can see here, even stream enderers um, seem not to be practicing samadhi by definition. Now, of course, some do, and good is great, but it's not a precondition uh, accomplishment in samadhi or the four jhanas, it seems. So we can conclude that the accomplishment in concentration, the jhanas, are not a precondition for the attainment of stream entry, which is confirmed by Ankutra 3.87 which states that only non-returners and arahants are accomplished in Samadhi. And maybe a small side note, uh, by the way, the, the case of dry inside arahants, that, which are supposedly arahants without jhanas, is not found in the suttas. So the discourses don't mention that. And from the perspective of the suttas, at least accomplishment in the first jhana would need to be there to qualify as Sama Samadhi. So one or two or three or four of the jhanas, but at least the first jhana. And it would at this point maybe also be important to discuss about the meaning and interpretations of the jhanas, but this will go uh, way beyond the scope uh, of this talk here. So let's keep it at this. <laughs> uh -huh. But I think this is a very relevant topic because if a person believes that a certain type of jhana is necessary already for stream entry, and especially if it's a very difficult form of jhana, uh, most jhanas are difficult. And so and you think you, because you don't have that access to the strong samadhi, therefore by definition you cannot be a sotapanna, that could also be then uh, lead to a misinterpretation uh, or to a wrong evaluation of one's own capabilities or of one's own potential. Uh, let me move on to the next question. Uh, can a Sotobana get greedy or angry? Uh, what do you think? Can a Sotobana be greedy or, or angry? Well, uh, we can look at the classification system of the 10 fetters. And the first one here is personality view. The view that none of the five aggregates is oneself. Second one, skeptical doubt. Number three, clinging to rules and rituals. Number four, craving for sense pleasures. Kama Raga. Number five, ill will, via bada. Number six, craving for fine material experience or existence. So wanting to um, stay in a state where you can dwell in the, jhana, in the jhanas, either in this life or uh, in a subsequent uh, plane of existence after death. Or craving for immaterial experience in the formless attainments. Mm -hmm. Then, conceit, uh, identification, number nine, restlessness, and lastly, ignorance. Mm -hmm. So these are the ten fetters that bind us to existence. And they disappear not all at once, uh, but in stages. So if we go back to the previous ones, number one, two, and three. These are the three fetters that are abandoned by the stream enderer. He has, his view is purified. He understands that there is no self to be found in any of the aggregates. Not the body, not the feeling, perception, volition, or consciousness. Also, he has no more doubt about 
the awakening of the Buddha, or that the Dhamma really leads and will lead to Nibbana, or that there are Aryas who have walked that path and have attained uh, liberation by following that path. There's no more doubt about that. And also, there's no more clinging to uh, certain ascetic practices or rituals on account of which alone they're meant to promise liberation. Like in ancient India, uh, there was often the situation where monks were uh, living even on a bed of thorns or um, practicing uh, living only in the open or mortifying the body by fasting to extremes or running around naked or sitting in the sun all day and even making a fire all around at the four directions and even put a plate of burning fire on top of your head. So these are all uh, rules and rituals that in ancient India were believed to lead to the unraveling of past bad karma and in this way lead to liberation. So Sri Mandra already knows this is not the path. It's the middle path that leads to liberation. So these three fetters the Sri Mandra has abandoned. So then the once returner also diminishes the next two, number four and five. The once returner also uh, reduces craving for sense pleasures and ill will. Reduces not yet abandoned, whereas the non-returner has also abandoned them. And it's only the Arahant who runs through the whole rest of the list and abandons the last five fetters. And you can see here uh, the fine material craving, because he has jhana and because he has formless attainments, maybe uh, that kind of craving he also needs to overcome for these states, as well as conceit, identification, and restlessness and ignorance. So these are the fetters that need to be overcome by the anagami leading up to arahantship. Um, so, as we, if we go back, we can see the Sotapanna has actually only overcome the first three, whereas number four and five, craving for sense pleasures and ill will, are actually still there. So, to answer the question, can a Sotapanna get greedy or angry? Oh, yes. Yeah. Because he has not overcome the fetters uh, of, se of sense pleasures and ill will. So we cannot jump to conclusions just because you see somebody uh, getting irritated at times. You cannot immediately jump to a conclusion, oh, cannot be a, an Arya. In fact, it could even be a, a Sakadagami. Uh, and even that's possible still even for a once returner. Um, a related question. Can a stream mentor still take things personally as if they were a self? No. Because actually he should not, right? Because he has overcome Sakaya Titi, personality view. He understands there is no self and he, has, he also understands right view. So how would he take things personally? Well, there's one teaching system where the Buddha explains. He speaks about the four distortions. Vipalasa. These are like uh, misperceptions or wrong views about four things. What are they? To regard what is really impermanent, to regard that as permanent. Or to regard something that is painful as promising happiness and pleasure. Or to regard something that is without a self as having a self. And lastly, to regard what is impure or ugly, asupa, as pure and beautiful. These are distortions, uh, the Buddha calls them. And these distortions can be either of perception, on a perception level, or of the mind, the citta, or of views, ditti. So, as Vailasotopana has indeed overcome the distortions on a view level, he knows that conditioned things are impermanent, unsatisfactory, non-self, 
and there's no inherent beauty to be found in them. So on a view level, he has overcome these distortions, but he has not yet overcome them on a spontaneous, on a perception level, on a sanya level. So he can still indulge, as we have seen just earlier, uh, the person can still indulge in sense pleasures and perceive them as pleasant, almost as if they were leading to happiness, even though he understands and he contemplates, he understands on a view level that they do not lead to happiness. So his view is purified, but his purified view has not penetrated his whole being, his heart and his whole makeup, so that he also spontaneously perceives things through the lens of his newly acquired right view. And that can take up to seven lifetimes until it really pervades and penetrates his whole being. So likewise, he may also get irritated or even angry when he's spoken to impolitely or maybe harshly. And he can take things personally as if there were a self, even though he understands on a view level that there is no self. So on a view level, yes, Sakaya Titi, right? Diti means view. Sakaya Diti has been removed, but mana, remember the ten feathers. Where does mana disappear? Let's go back. Where does mana disappear? Here, only for the Arahant. So mana is still there. Identification and comparing, conceit, that is still there, even for the stream enter. So therefore, there can be identification, even though he understands there is no self. So on a spontaneous level, he may th take things personally, but when he reflects, contemplates, he immediately understands ah, there is no self to be found. So yes, the stream and drug and the lower areas, they can, can take things uh, personally, but an other hand does never, does not. Okay. Um, I see we are a bit running out of time. Actually, I still have quite a few interesting quotes prepared. Uh, I think uh, maybe we will just continue uh, for a while and uh, the video will be anyway be recorded. So if you have something to do, uh, you can continue watching afterwards. Uh, it will be remaining anyway on Facebook or YouTube, uh, so that's fine. Uh, but I think I have still a few interesting points that you think are very re relevant and related to this topic. So if you're interested, uh, please bear with me. Uh, it's probably another uh, 20 minutes, half an hour uh, that we, until we come to the end of our summary about stream entry and the potential of stream entry.